So if this was the day that you were going to come see us play, check the weather. Okay? We do play down at Carter Park every Sunday. Um, 7.15 is today's game. I'll try to remember to make these announcements. People have been encouraging me to do that, and I just forget. Okay? So I apologize for that. But check the weather, because I don't know if we're going to play in the rain or not. I don't want to play in the rain personally. Um, there's an Equality Toledo fundraiser on June 24th. Tickets are $20 for that. So if you are interested in that, they have two different seatings. Um, check your uh, program for that for further information. Um, we also have a membership class and confirmation starting. Again, if you have a child who would like a child, teenager, that would like to go through that uh, confirmation class, or if you're an adult that would like to go through the membership class, again, check your program. This is a lovely piece of paper. You might want to take it with you. Good for future reference. That's really all I have to say.
you feel like doing that. You don't have to stand on it. God by name. Tell everyone you meet what God has done. Sing songs, belt out hymns, 
translate God's wonders into music. Honor God's holy name with hallelujahs. You who seek God, live a happy life. Keep your eyes open for God. Watch for the works. Be alert for signs of God's presence. Remember the world of wonders God has made, the miracles and the verdicts rendered. Our God is in charge of the whole earth and remembers the covenant. For a thousand generations, God has been as good as God's word. It's the covenant God made with Abraham, the same oath sworn to Isaac, the very statute established with Jacob, the eternal covenant with Israel. Namely, I give you the land. Canaan is your hill country inheritance. When they didn't count for much, a mere handful, and strangers at that, wandering from country to country, drifting from pillar to post, God permitted no one to abuse them. God told kings to keep their hands off. Don't you dare lay a hand on my anointed. Don't hurt a hair on the heads of my prophets. Remember this. God led the people out singing for joy. God's chosen people marched, singing their hearts out. God made them a gift of the country they entered. Helped them seize the wealth of the nation so they could do everything God told them. Could follow the instructions to the letter. Hallelujah. Let's work together, people.
covenant. We're going to talk about covenant today. When we talk about God and God's people, it doesn't get much more basic than the idea of covenant. It's one of the very first theological terms. Theological, remember, just means words about God, how we talk about God, relate. Covenant appears in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. And it just keeps popping up over and over again. If you went to Sunday school as a child, maybe they taught you the difference between a contract and a covenant, or maybe if you've ever taken a legal course, a contract is between two human beings. Now, my lawyer husband will correct me if I'm wrong. I think if one human being breaks the contract, then it's broken. Is that right? You can make the other one do what they're supposed to do. You can still make them do what they're supposed to do. But if, I, if you break a contract, once one person breaks one side of the contract, there's a problem, right? There's a problem. In a covenant, it's between God and a human being. And God never breaks the covenant. That's the difference between a contract. See, if I make a contract with Kristen, she might break it or I might break it. But in a covenant, it's between God and a person or God and a group of people and human beings. We talked about this last week. Will human beings fail eventually? Probably. God never breaks a covenant. God never breaks a covenant because God does not fail us. So in our psalm for this week, we have some praise, right? We've been reading a lot of psalms. Psalms have a lot of praise and thanksgiving. Let me just reread a couple of bits and pieces of that. God is in charge of the earth, and God remembers the covenant. For a thousand generations, God has been as good as God's word. It's the covenant that God made with Abraham, and then it continued with Isaac and Jacob, the eternal covenant with Israel. Namely, I give you the land. Canaan is your hill country inheritance. Land was really important to those people, right? They lived off the land. And then later it goes like this. God led the people out singing for joy. God's chosen people marched singing their hearts out because God gave them the gift of the country that they entered. And they shouted, Hallelujah. This covenant's good stuff. It's good stuff. It's powerful talks about a deep relationship that keeps the people going through hard times. We need some of that, don't we? You need, you need something that connects you to God and keeps you going through hard times? Can I hear hallelujah? Hallelujah. So in the church, we use the language of covenant to talk about our relationships with one another. In the church... We use covenant to talk about individual churches that are connected to a larger body of churches. In denominations, we're connected to one another as churches and ultimately to the church, little c church, big c church. There, you see, there's only really one church. Did you know that? The church of Jesus Christ. Don't let anybody tell you that there's lots of churches. There's really only one church and we're part of it. Don't let anybody tell you that we're not part of the true church. One of the things I really love about the United Church of Christ, the UCC, is that it's called a united and a uniting church. That's why it's called the United Church. It was founded back in 1957 as a union of two denominations. And it was a union of two denominations that was a union of two other denominations before that. I think way back when, there's 13 denominations altogether that have come together to make the United Church of Christ. That's a united church that's focused on united and united, wouldn't you say? It's all about coming together and focusing on our unity in Jesus Christ. Each individual congregation has our own autonomy to have our own bylaws, but we're connected through what we call this covenant relationship. That's why the UCC loves to do stuff with other denominations, and it's why the village is connected to two denominations. We're UCC and United Methodist, because 
If you go up to the UCC and you say you want to plant a church with somebody else, they're like, what do you think they're going to say? Sure. Because it's all one church. So we're connected to the United Methodist Church, too. The United Methodist Church uses language of connectionalism. We're a connected church to talk about the covenant. We talk about the connection to show that every local church is connected through uh, these geographic entities we call districts and conferences. I'm talking about this this week because uh, Pat and Kurt and I went to annual conference at the West Ohio Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church this week and then yesterday Kristen and I went to the conference of the West Ohio Conference of the United Church of Christ. Can you say all that? Not real fast. Not real fast. I can't because my dad was a preacher. I've been doing this uh, 49 years. We believe in the United Methodist Church in these covenant relationships. We come together in what we call holy conferencing. That's what we did this week, holy conferencing. We believe that when we come together, the body of Christ goes stronger. There's a sense of accountability in these conferences. We check in with each other. And when we come together, we can affect more positive change in the world because we pool our resources. I'm going to see if Sun Ho can pull up a picture of an airplane. Do you remember, if you were here last week, I talked about Gaston Ntambo, who is a pilot in Africa. And he's been flying this plane to bring medical care to people and to um, bring supplies to people. And his plane is so old that he has to go across the border to another country to get fuel, right? Because the, the, the um, <coughs> country that he lives and works in doesn't have the fuel that he needs anymore. So the West Ohio Conference and some other people have been working to raise $1.6 million to buy him a new plane for his ministry called Wings of the Morning. Well, if you see the blue part here, it says Miracle Offering up there, $500,000. At our conference this week, we were hoping that people would bring money from their local churches so that we could raise the last $500,000, the last half million. You'll see early on at the tip of the plane, we had already raised um, a quarter of a million. And the United Methodist Committee on Relief kicked in five. Out here at the end of the plane, you can see various amounts of money. The, the North Katanga Conference in Africa raised 25,000. We sold the, we could sell the plane to raise some money. The New Jersey Conference raised 320,000. Some other conferences, that tiny little slip in the middle, raised 4000 That's fine, you know, they made an effort. So our hope was to raise half a million this week. The village took up a modest offering last week. We're a small church. We're a new church. We didn't spend all year raising money. We raised $75 last week. I figured that might pay for a bolt. What do you think? But it might be the bolt that keeps the engine on, right? And we have some offering envelopes over here that say special offering on them. So if you want to contribute more, the money can still come in to continue to pay for fuel and maintenance on this plane. Well, we took up the offering on Tuesday, the miracle offering, and the total was $986,754. You can back for that. Well, of course, we were close enough to a million. We wanted a million, right? Actually, we were about, we were about, um, 75,000 short of a million, so a good African-American pastor stood up and said, Bishop, we need to take another offering. So we took up another offering and raised some more money. But we were still short, and so some pastors stood up and, and pledged, my, my church will raise another 5,000, my church will raise another five, another five. So we got pledges in 37,500 to raise a grand total in cash and pledges of $1,024,254. Yeah. <laughs> And you might say, well, we only needed half a million. Why did we go for a million? Well, clearly, they got to, they're going to need money to maintain the plane, to buy fuel, to continue this ministry. So Gaston was thrilled. He made a speech. A letter came out. I want to read a little bit of it to you. Gaston wrote, we will honor all of your sacrifices by using this airplane as a tool in North Katanga in the Tanzania Annual Conferences to reach out and spread the good news and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. We now... We have a perfect tool that we can use to reduce malaria victims. A child does not have to die every 60 seconds from malaria. By the way, we also learned at the conference that we've been buying these nets 
these bed nets that they use to cover people in their sleep to um, protect them from malaria. And already, because of the uh, efforts of the United Methodist Church and, and others to put bed nets in Africa, uh, instead of a child dying every 30 seconds from malaria, they're only dying every 60 seconds. We have cut that in half, which is just phenomenal. He went on to say, um, you touched and changed my life with your mission work. When you sent me, the, the West Ohio Conference sent me my very first pair of shoes at nine years of age. That's how this started. We sent a pair of shoes that he got when he was nine. His father is, by the way, now the bishop of the conference there. Today, you are sending me home with a perfect airplane to go and make a difference for our people. Thank you for believing in us and for saving North Katanga wings of the morning flight ministry. I am proud of my United Methodist Church, and our God is an awesome God, and God is on the throne, because I never thought in all my life that I could ever say that I am going shopping for an airplane. <laughs> but here we go, Gaston Tampo. And we got to be a part of that. We can claim to be a part of that. We got a humble offer, but if I stood up and told you, we're going to go buy a plane, you would have said, Cher, you are really nuts. You have really gone off the deep end. But we get to help buy a plane because we're part of the covenant. <coughs> Now I want to tell you what this covenant and this connection means to the village. <clears throat> Both of these denominations have been funding us since 2008. Um, so I'm go ahead and put the next um, slide up. In 2008, the United Methodist Church and the United Church of Christ gave us $30,000. The red here shows the grant money that we got. In 2009, these denominations gave us $91,500. 2010, they gave us $86,666. In 2011, they gave us $73,332. In 2012, they gave us $37,832. And next year, they will give us $6,667. The United Methodist Church and the United Church of Christ, the denominations through the district, the conference, and the national level, by the time we're done, will have given us $325,000. $997. I think you can clap for them. I guess we don't need a plane. Kristen says we can't buy a plane with that. We didn't really need a plane. That's a lot of money. And you're here because they invested in us. Churches send in money and they invested in us. You can go ahead back to the other um, the other slide actually is, uh, you can go back to the regular slide, I mean the theme slide. This is actually people pouring their offering into the uh, big basket at annual conference, donating their money for the miracle offering. So I just spent the past week at these denominational conferences and, and part of the time was spent hearing about how um, these denominations, like every other mainline denominations, are struggling right now. But there's some downside to these denominations, and we've talked about that. Both are trying to restructure because the huge organizational systems are not working very well. Both are trying to um, restructure. The reports from the United Methodist uh, General Conference in Tampa a few weeks back um, were dismal. They're working at restructuring, and the work was very discouraging. After countless hours and dollars, after four years preparation, they spent countless hours and dollars at this meeting, um, and they came out with no plan for a new structure. Right? They voted on three different plans, and at the end of the week, they had no plan. We're back with nothing after all that work. At the Ohio conference yesterday, Kristen and I heard some fairly um, con concerning reports about deficit spending. Deficit spending. If, if, the, if we don't figure out a way to do some things differently at the conference level in a year, year or two, they're going to be out of money. They'll figure something out, but because we're spending down our reserves. But in the bits, in the midst of this, both of these entity, entities have set aside money for missions and for planting new churches like the village. Our church and others like us are a sign of hope. We are a beacon of hope. 
sometimes we might get discouraged. Anybody been discouraged about things around here? But we are their hope. Everywhere I went in this last week, people were asking how we're doing, and they wanted to hear stories of our ministry. And I told them about all the exciting things we're doing and about all of you and how much this church means to you. Two veteran pastors who have who have given us ongoing support without me even asking walked up and handed me checks for $250 each. They weren't even back around to my list of people I wanted to ask money for yet. Right? And they just walked up and handed me checks because they believe in us. At the UCC meeting yesterday, the keynote speaker was encouraging folks to take some risks in worship and especially kind of get out there with the music. He was really pushing folks to get out of their comfort zone. And you can imagine that most of the folks there were from some more established churches. Kristen and I sat there smiling because most of what he was saying was business as usual around here. We, we were feeling pretty good. We are making a difference because we are becoming a model church in Ohio. And when people sit in meetings and they hear about what churches ought to be doing, they're thinking, I think they're doing some of that stuff over there at that place called The Village. I've heard about that church. We sat down at lunch and people said, oh, I've heard of The Village. And one guy popped up our website on his little phone. He's like, oh, I love your website. That's fun. People have invested time and money in us. And now we can help them learn how to reach generations and segments of the population that have been long neglected by both of our denominations. This is what it means to be part of a covenant community. They have invested in us. We can all invest in important missions like the one in Africa and right here in our community. And together, we are changing the world. And so as we grow stronger on our financial feed, we're going to be asked to contribute back into our denominations. There are funds that both the UCC and the United Methodist Church have. They're called covenant funds. They, they both have different names. The United Church of Christ calls theirs our church's wider mission. That's what they use to help us. In the United Methodist Church, the apportionment fund is broken up into several categories. One is called Church World Service. We contributed a very token amount to those at the end of last year. As we grow into self-sufficiency, we'll want to move towards tithing. Tithing a portion of what we receive here in our offering back into those covenant funds. You see, we all work together because we all belong to God, and we know that. God gave our ancestors land and promised to be their God. They had a covenant, and we have a covenant. We are inheritors of the covenant. Our part of the covenant is to be God's people, to care for the land and for the people who live on it. And that's why we buy airplanes to deliver medical supplies to people and to help transport them for medical care. And that's why existing churches have given money to plant the village. We're all connected to one another. There are hundreds of United Methodist churches and United Churches of Christ that we're connected to in covenant in Ohio and even more across the world. And all those churches are a sign of the strength of the covenant. God is blessing us. Do you feel that blessing? Do you have a sense of that blessing? And God never backs out on God's part of the covenant. That's the most important message of today. We may fall away. Our human institutions and systems may strain under the weight of irrelevancy. And we're experiencing some of that right now. But the strength of our relationship with God is never broken on God's part because God holds on to us. And we... We can always return to the covenant because God is always there with, with God's hands reaching out. This church, every one of you, just look around. This church, this community is a sign. It's a sign of God's covenant. So let's celebrate that sign. Thanks be to God. Let the people say amen. Amen.
While we were at uh, Lakeside this week, Pat and I celebrated Holy Communion every morning with the um, kind of an informal gathering of some of our friends from more progressive churches. Pat, do you want to come read this liturgy with me? I marked it out for us to do. Are you prepared to do that? You can read without preparing. If I can, you know, see something to read, I don't know that one is. <clears throat> I'm just going to have it on me, sir. Um, so I marked off every other section for you. We, um, usually we do a very informal liturgy, but today I'm going to read a, uh, I'm just going to give you mine. We're going to read this because it was written by a couple of our friends in one of our sister churches, and Pat and I shared in this communion liturgy every morning and we really liked it and so we wanted to share it with you. I would just remind you that when we celebrate communion here at the village, uh, it's an open table. Everyone is invited to share in communion uh, after we read the prayers of Thanksgiving and we're ready to serve. We invite you to come forward. Uh, we'll invite you over to the table and just uh, come down as you like from this side. We'll give you a piece of bread and invite you to dip it into the cup. And we do use grape juice when we're uh, serving communion. Go ahead, eat the bread, and then return to your seats from this side. And I'm going to move a little closer to the table on this side. So when Jesus sat at tables and broke bread with tax collectors, lawyers, rich elites, and poor peasants, he proclaimed that God's gracious love and abiding presence knows no bounds. Through these occasions of sharing food, women and men experienced God and shared in God's kingdom, a kingdom where all are welcome, worthy, and invited. Lives are transformed and empowered, and the fruits of God's gentle justice bloom throughout all creation. All people, including each of us, are invited to share in this sacred meal of celebration and be strengthened by the presence of God in this place. At meals, Jesus and the women and men disciples resisted the divisions injustice and violence of society, they lived out an alternative reality, the kingdom of God, a place of love, justice, and mutuality. Today we celebrate these meals and ministries, but we also recognize that not all people understood Jesus' ministry. In fact, for some people it was scandalous. They said, look, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. As we know, Jesus' life and ministry became endangered. When his arrest seemed near, Jesus ate a meal in an upper room with the disciples. As he had done so many times before, he took bread, and after giving thanks to you, holy God, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, this time saying, do this to remember me. After the meal, he shared the wine, he gave thanks and said, I will not drink from this cup again until I drink it with you in the kingdom of God. Jesus was then unjustly killed by the systems of domination of his day. To some of his, fright his frightened disciples, it seemed that the bread symbolized his broken body and the wine his blood. It also seemed like injustice and violence killed Jesus in his ministry. But the resurrection provided a new hope. There were more meals and more ministries. We thank you, Holy God, that the Last Supper wasn't the last meal or the last word. Therefore, Holy God, in the sharing of this bread and cup, we joyfully celebrate the hope-inspiring ministry and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Gracious God, may this meal for us be a meal of hope where we encounter your presence in the sharing of this food just as those before us have. May the sharing of this food also be a taste of your presence, so we may be strengthened to be your joyful and hopeful disciples. May we share in your ministry of love, justice, and mutuality with those around us. Amen. Holy God, bless each of us in the meal we will share, so that we may be open to your abiding presence nourished by your gracious love, and strengthened by your resurrection power. Amen. Before we come forward, let me just remind you that after communion, we'll share our joys and concerns and our prayers. And so if you would like to write one of those down, there are prayer cards in the basket. And also, if you'd like to pick up 
a special offering envelope for the Wings of the Morning. Some of those are located on the table over here, and they just have a tag on them that say special offering, uh, circled in green. And so now come and taste the hope and know God is present with us here now. Amazing God, thank you for your presence in this place. We also thank you for giving us a taste of your hope in this meal. Use this food to strengthen us to be your joyful and hopeful resurrection community. Amen. I want to share the joys and concerns that we have today. My mother's birthday was on June 14th. She's She's, she's in her 80s. Yes? Yes? Nine times nine plus one. Well, there you go. Now you can do your math and tell how she is. We think she's the, the uh, senior member of our congregation. If anybody wants to try to talk her, you let me know. But I don't think anybody wants to. So happy birthday, Mom. And my son, Jamie, is going to church camp today for the first time. So uh, we want to pray that Jamie and all the campers have a good time this week at church camp. Let's pray together. Holy God, we thank you for miracles. We thank you for a wonderful offering this week and in your conference and for the many people who will be touched by the ministry of the Wings of the Morning. At the same time, our hearts break with yours thought that we have cut in half the number of people who died from malaria because the numbers are still staggering. And so God, we pray that we might continue to work together. This church, along with so many other churches, to change the world, to bring hope and healing. God, we thank you for faithful people who love you and who love their church and who faithfully give not only their money but so much more. We thank you for people who make decisions to share resources so that the village might be blessed and we might be here. God, help us not to take for granted blessings of covenant. Help us to not take for granted that you promise to be our God and that you call us to be your people. Help us not to take for granted that you never walk away from us even when we wander far. And so God, in whatever ways we are wandering away from you, we would dare to say today that we want to come back each one of us wants to walk back to you and strengthen our covenant. God, strengthen this church. Let us be faithful. Let us grow in strength that we might truly change the world. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. collecting our offering now and as we do that if you would just reach out and touch that basket just thank and praise God for all of his blessings today is the day it is
Today is the day, and so go out into the world and bless everyone you meet and let them know that this is the day to make peace and to share God's love.